Well, the, the way I have um, tried to uh, reach people is through what in the Western world is known as the Socratic method, where you ask people questions and get uh, responses from them. Uh, because it's my belief that uh, everyone knows the answers to all the questions they have, that inherent in the question is the answer itself. Uh, and it's also the very much the method through which, uh, through which the teaching was done. Sure, sure. Yeah, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, what is your way of method of teaching? I've learned to adopt various uh, styles of teaching. And in fact, uh, I was first exposed to the Socratic method as it's formerly known when I was in medical school here in All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And we had a visiting professor from Harvard and he asked us, if you were God, how would you make a fat molecule in our biochemistry class? I thought that was extremely interesting because everybody in our class came up with extremely creative and innovative answers. The Socratic method as it's known in the West was also part of the teaching system in the Upanishads where the Rishi and his student would sit together and there would be an ongoing dialogue. So it wasn't that one person is just didactically giving information uh, to the student. Y you can do that on television. Uh, if you really want to learn, I think there has to be a dialogue. Um, and how do you combine these three methods of the Western style? Uh, first of all, you know, I'm very uncomfortable with the word, uh, word mysticism because it implies that uh, you don't know what the underlying basis is and it's steeped in some woolly, abstract, unfathomable field. Uh, I think what people call mysticism is just something that they don't understand scientifically. If you have an understanding for it, then it's science. And I like to look upon the Vedic literature as uh, some of the most profound scientific uh, understanding of the workings of nature. And uh, my preference is to use the word Vedic science, just like we use this, you know, mathematical science or physics or, or astronomy. There's Vedic science which was developed by some very profound thinkers and they were not just philosophers, they were scientists of consciousness. So there's no, there's no question of combining East and West, it's just explaining it. Okay, and uh, what, uh, what do you aim to achieve as in combining it? What is the... What's the goal? Yeah. I have no goal. I think uh, my journey is my destination. I'm enjoying the process and the, the main reason I'm doing it is that I enjoy it thoroughly and as I explore it, I share it and there are a lot of people who seem to enjoy sharing it with me. What is the, how people are getting attracted to you, your way of teaching? I think it's mainly the fact that it's in common English and it's in language that people can understand and is not steeped in the so-called mystical tradition and the abstract way of thinking that uh, has usually been used in order to explore the realm of consciousness. So I, I personally feel it's, uh, it's basically um, the fact that I can translate so-called abstract concepts into ordinary language. And part of it is my Indian accent, I'm kidding. And uh, it's some kind of meditation in other words. Yes, the meditative process is very crucial to go beyond the rational mind and most of my workshops include uh, at least part of the whole process includes the ability to silence the mind and go beyond the turbulence of your inner dialogue. How exactly do you use this? We use many kinds of meditations, mantra meditation, breathing awareness, uh, mindfulness, vipassana, uh, pranayam, many yogic techniques, so the whole range of meditative processes that are part of our tradition. What is the kind of thing you are planning to have in India? We are doing a one week workshop for corporate leaders that helps take people beyond the reactive uh, modes of thinking, beyond the linear logical mode of thinking into a form of thinking 
that's more contextual, more relational, more holistic, more nourishing, doesn't have a windows orientation, and takes people beyond ordinary reactive responses into what I've started calling the intuitive mode of thinking, the creative mode of thinking, the visionary response, and ultimately the sacred response. Would it be possible for you to do meditation the, it's meditation the, the process is internal and there's nothing to see. Uh, there's nothing else. I want to add uh, one, more, one or two questions. Sure. Uh, there are enough schools of uh, meditation and uh, say yoga in India. Uh, how different is your school going to be? It's not different as far as the meditative process is concerned. It's all taken from the, the various authentic schools of meditation in India. What is different about the process that we do is that we combine that with a lot of understanding of the human thought process, a lot of interactive workshops, a lot of questioning, a lot of processing into taking specific problems and then finding the solutions that are inherent in the, in the problems and then in fact taking those solutions to create something that never existed before. So every problem that you have is actually an opportunity in disguise and how to recognize that. That's not part of what you know the meditative schools teach, but the meditations are an excellent tool to at least allow your mind to go to a level of silence where you're able to do this. Otherwise, the turbulence of your own in inner dialogue interferes with that process. Uh, why has it taken so long for you to come back to India? As I said earlier to somebody who asked me the same question, I go only where I'm invited. I don't like to gate crash. And uh, this is the first time I've been asked to do something in India. I've lectured and done workshops all over the world, but uh, this is the first time I've been asked to do something in India. So how does it feel to be, um, you always link to superstars, uh, people like Michael Jackson, Debbie Moore, that's the media's problem, uh, you know, uh, of all the people that I reach, um, the superstars and the quote-unquote celebrities are less than 0.000001% of the people that I reach. I'm doing much more work with inner city children, with orphans, with single mothers in, in, and drug addicts in, in Los Angeles and other places. I'm doing work in Colombia, South America with children with heart disease. So I'm reaching out to a whole range of people that's never mentioned in the press. And uh, the press is totally fascinated with the uh, superstars who are very ordinary people and are just entertainers. I don't know what the fascination is. I also think that the press tends to confuse celebrities with heroes. You know, celebrities are people who either sing, sing well or run the 100 meter dash well or can hit a ball with a bat extremely well. And when we set up people like that to be role models in our society and really create such an intense fascination with them, then there's something drastically wrong with our society. And then what about the controversy which press keeps generating about people who are becoming famous, like you also? You, you have been, been in some kind of controversy lately. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, some of those controversies are being settled as we speak. In fact, uh, if you're referring to the Weekly Standard article, that uh, is going to find a very good resolution in the next few days. Yeah, I'm actually extremely proud that I've taken on one of the most powerful people in the world uh, who probably is not going to buy up your, uh, buy up your station because it's partly government control. But uh, Mr. Rupert Murdoch's organization was behind that and we have now found out the criminal intent of some people and this is going to be very uh, soon in the press. Uh, there are other controversies. I've just written an article for Playboy magazine which is drawing a lot of attention. And my response to all of this is that, you know, if you're constantly worried about what people think of you, you'll never do anything creative. I have gone, it has taken me a long time, it's taken me maybe 10 years to consciously work on this process to go beyond worrying what people are saying about me because then I wouldn't be able to write or wouldn't be able to do what I really enjoy doing with a passion. Uh, in, in many ways, controversy draws attention and when attention is drawn, it helps you to think even more creatively. So, you know, I'm not afraid of controversy. 
uh, in, in my subconscious, I must in fact uh, in, inspire it or even want it, otherwise I wouldn't have it. Is there any way you want to come back and settle down in India? I personally, uh, you know, subscribe to that school of thought that J. Krishnamurti very articulately uh, once expressed that nationalism in any form is a sophisticated form of tribalism and that's true of any kind of nationalism, whether it's Indian nationalism or American nationalism. I'd like to see a global family uh, which is brought about through the information age that we now have. People getting beyond racism and ethnocentrism and bigotry and uh, hatred and prejudice and particularly religious uh, fervor because it is religious fundamentalism of all kinds and you know I used to be extremely proud that we are not a militant people particularly Hindus and Buddhists but I say that I can't see that say that justifiably anymore so I'd like to go beyond all kinds of nationalism in my own personal life but then physically residing would you want to reside in India uh, would I like to? I consider myself a gypsy. You know, there's an old uh, Sufi poem by Rumi. He says, uh, "In love with life, my soul lives the subtlest of passions. Lives like a gypsy, each day a different house, each night under the stars." Uh, I like India. When I come to India, uh, there's certainly certain archetypal memories and uh, certain uh, what you might call very basic emotions that are aroused as, um, after all, part of the history of this civilization and you can't escape your history and there's no need to either. Uh, I love being here but there are many places in the world I love being also. Uh, I do think that as the years go by I'll be spending more and more time in India for sure. One last question. You talked about a journey. Where do you, where do you see yourself 10 years from now? I see uh, myself basically out of circulation in 10 years from now. Uh, I think uh, once uh, you reach, you know, everything that exists has a beginning, a middle, and the ending, and we're speaking right now in the middle of it. You've caught me at the crest of a huge wave of popularity. But like every phenomenon in life, there's a beginning, a middle, and an ending. Everything has a lifespan. I'd see 10 years from now <coughs> some of the major things I'm involved in. I'm uh, right now involved in setting up a global channel on television uh, with Paul Allen, the founder of Microsoft. I'm involved in changing the, the way entertainment is dispensed to the world. So entertainment is combined with education and motivation and inspiration. I'm involved with information technology on the internet. Uh, with, uh, with websites that will be interactive so you can not only get information but you can actually interact with many thinkers, not just one thinker. I'm involved in setting up uh, global networks of creative people who can connect with each other in their fields. I'm involved with a lot of work with inner cities where people are really deprived and have absolutely nothing in their life. And you know, it's all right to say we'll give them charity, but there's, you know, there's a saying, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So I'm involved in a number of projects. I feel that there's, these projects will take on a life of their own at a certain point, and then I can relinquish my being there, and then I can really cultivate what I've, in my personal life, wanted to. You know, it's one thing to write about this stuff and another thing to actually be living it totally. And I'd like to explore what I'm writing about experientially even more, even though I do it now, but much more. And then there's another realm that I'm really involved in, and that's the realm of fa fiction and fantasy writing. So I've created programs for television that take some of the Vedic concepts that I have, but also other mythical traditions like the Arthurian legends in England and the Celtic traditions of Scandinavia and put them in, in, in entertainment, in, in movies, in soap operas, in music. And so that's where I am now. But uh, 10 years from now, maybe I won't be doing anything, maybe living in a little place in Goa or Bali or something. As of now, you want to continue writing or you want to give that up also? 
No, I'm writing a lot. I just have a new book that came out this week, and uh, I have already three more books that I've committed to in the next two years. Uh, and then after that, I'm doing a Broadway musical uh, based on The Way of the Wizard, so I have a lot of writing to do. But I don't consider that work. It's, it's something that I love doing.